My name is Mike Moreto, a manager of corporate finance at the uh, BC Securities Commission. Um, a big thank you to Davidson for hosting this session and um, for having me as a speaker. And uh, a thank you for all of you to take time out of your day to uh, come in and, and participate in the update. I had a quick question for Guy of whether he considered whether he was really hosting Halloween or hosting a rave for those under 14. <laughs> I was like, I, I don't think I've seen 1,200 people go down a street in an evening, but uh, you know what? Yeah, well, that's why I was kind of wondering, but uh, <laughs> does he amortize the cost over the year with the candy? Can he capitalize it? But uh, you know what? At, at the end of the day, though, Guy, in today's day and age, I think it, it, it's a lot of kudos for, uh, for keeping the community spirit. I think that that's something that seems to be lost as we go through, through things with people being fearful of doing things at, on, a, on a grand scale. So um, next year, that's where I'm headed, North Shore, <laughs> <laughs> packing up the kids. Anyway, um, so uh, in the presentation, uh, I, re I really wanted to cover the year that was from, from a regulatory perspective. What, what did we look at? What did we find? And, and a bit of what, uh, what's on our radar. Um, you know, try to get a, a few of the, the topical areas and uh, a bit of the primer on the future. First of all, the year there was the numbers. Uh, looks a little daunting as a pie chart, um, but really wanted to, to, to kind of focus on what we look at at the, at the commission. Um, <clears throat> and and um, really the bulk of our reviews tend to be issue-oriented reviews as you can see from this. Um, rationale for that is we're trying to find areas that uh, where there's inconsistent treatment, uh, a new issue that has come up that needs attention of public companies, or correction in the marketplace. Um, it could be a bit of, bit of everything, and a lot of it is more educational driven. So quite often you will see that our issue-oriented reviews dwarf our, our full reviews doesn't mean we still don't do full reviews and those are much more um, um, kind of based on risk assessment and us uh, we have a risk model that we that we use to select our issuers and um, that's the typical um, source of our full reviews um, I'm gonna just jump ahead here in, in terms of the the to highlight some of the <clears throat> The areas that we did do issue-oriented reviews, I know Guy had put in the IFRS 15 as the new one. We actually did a, an issue-oriented review two years ago on, on the readiness of IFRS 15 as it relates to disclosure. Um, so that, that, that would be a prime <laughs> example of an area where we see a change coming down the pipe and we're looking at it and trying to, to help it, issuers either prepare for it, well, first be aware of it, <laughs> Second, prepare for it, and, and three, um, dis get on track with the disclosure, especially on the big items such as IFRS 15, because it was going to be such a big change. For those having revenue, um, we did an issue-oriented review two years ago where we reminded issuers of their disclosure uh, requirements leading up to the implementation of that standard. So it's not on our list, but it certainly was something that we did cover and thought was important. And probably what it, 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 it allowed us to do was to get out there in the marketplace and, and um, really tell issuers, be prepared and, and, and beef up your disclosure as the new standards come in. So in, in the year, <coughs> pardon me, our issue-oriented reviews, some of the bigger ones, uh, quarterly highlights and exec comp. Uh, for any of you in the audience that were here last year, um, you know, I continue to pound my fist on the table, say we changed venture issuer rules two years ago, uh, try to make it uh, much more streamlined. Um, so what we did was did a quarterly highlights and exec comp review of venture issuers using the new um, format and try to see what we, what we could see in, in terms of the level of uptake and the level of compliance. What we found, still not a lot of uptake on it. Um, for those that have kind of uh, adopted the concept of quarterly highlights and exec comp, we found that on average things were, were okay. And I, I guess the fear in terms of just saying okay 
is that again, in, in, the, in, in my regulatory world, I'd say you're still doing too much, which of course is hard for me to spit out as you can see, you're doing too much. But, um, but what we found is really, you know, as we kind of develop these, we're, and you know, I think last year, I really tried to reiterate that we're not out there to play the gotcha. We're really looking for issuers to kind of start at the bottom uh, strip away any, uh, you know, kind of let's try to take our MDNA and, and pair it back, but really just build it up from the ground, the ground up. So what we're still finding is that when we did our review, there was still a lot of work that, that could be uh, progress that could be made by taking things away. So st heaven forbid over disclosure. So that's just a, more of a, a personal note from my aspect because, I, you know, I, I still encouraging issuers to get on board with the uh, quarterly highlights and exec comp and i'll, I'll kind of jump into into a bit more later when, when i talk about the reg reducing regulatory burden project um, we did an issue oriented review on cybersecurity. this one was fairly narrow uh, really looking at um, I I issuers who had um, a material uh, aspect to holding information and whether they are uh, correctly and adequately disclosing the risks associated with any cybersecurity breaches. So fairly narrow. The way I think about this is anyone, you know, kind of retail issuers. Um, so we, we do have a couple of big retail um, um, BC based issuers, but uh, you know, could it be, it could be things like banks, retail, anyone who has uh, investment funds, a lot of it, in information that could be susceptible to um, some sort of cybersecurity breach. And I, I guess in today's world, no one's uh, immune from uh, cybersecurity and what they, they might uh, try to, uh, to hack into and take away. So certainly we're just looking to ensure issuers had some disclosure on it. Uh, rights offerings, this is a bit of, of a very narrow topic. Uh, a year and a half ago, we put in new, new uh, uh, streamlined rights offerings um, exemptions that allowed for a much more streamlined form that was very um, free form. And our issue oriented review was just to try to track it over the implementation stage of a year, see what we, what we could see. And generally we found um, fairly uh, high level of compliance. And mine, last but not least, mining technical and oil and gas disclosure. I say it, it typically equates to about 50% of our issue oriented reviews and, and we classify our mining technical uh, reviews as, as issue oriented. So the, the, you, when you jump back the two, you can see how we can get to 287 when we're kind of uh, including some of the mining technical, which is a big part of our marketplace. I'll flash this up, it really the year that was in, in terms of the outcomes, I don't really want to focus on it too much in terms of breaking each piece of the pie down, but recognizing that we have full reviews and issue oriented reviews. And a lot of the issue oriented reviews for, are for education uh, purposes. And uh, the full reviews tend to be looking at both education and compliance. So, um, you know, the big, the big piece here is uh, in half the cases, no action was required. So, you know, that's a pretty good thing. You pat yourselves on the back if you're one of the, one of the two. Uh, <laughs> Uh, who had gone through a, 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 a review and not had any um, outcomes. The others are really default lists, cease traded referrals, uh, re refilings, perspective changes, education and awareness. So really just to try to give you a flavor of, of uh, where things fall when we do do our reviews. Okay, topical areas of, uh, that we've found in, in our, oh, one last thing is we typically do a CSA staff notice every year that, that outlines our activities and the results. This year we published one, but that, that um, notice just said we were gonna do it biannually. So I think some people have asked, are we lazy now doing it every two years? And um, that it's actually part of the issue is that some of the smaller jurisdictions just don't have the staff resources to do it every year. But I think what we were finding is that issuers were kind of micromanaging to the staff notice. So the staff notice would come out and say, hey, top five things on financial statements, top five things on, on MD&A that we're looking at, and just try to manage to those. 
okay, I don't have anything on that one. Maybe I got one on that, so I'll work on it. So, you know, it was felt that really switching to a biannual basis was, uh, was gonna be more beneficial for the street and, and for our own internal uh, resourcing purposes. So jumping ahead, topical areas in the financial statements, business combinations. Uh, building a bit on what Peter has kind of talked about, recognizing goodwill and intangibles and contingent consideration. Those were an area that, uh, that we felt uh, uh, needed some highlighting. Operating segments, I think this one's kind of continued from last year. I know this was around last year and it's really picked up when we start to see um, the encompassing of all the issuers disclosure. So MD&A, and, and kind of whatever else is out there in an annual report or a president's message and building it back to through to the financial statements and finding inconsistencies. So, you know, where we see it in more of the <clears throat> marketing side is, is talked about in operating segments that's not really consistent what's, what's flowing through the financial statements. So that's an area to, to kind of be aware of and, and to do some thinking of. Disclosure of change in accounting policies. Obviously, uh, Guy highlighted four areas that uh, where the new standards are, are changing. So that disclosure has to be in the financial statements. So uh, I think this is an area that never really goes away. It just kind of ebbs and flows as, as, uh, as the new sections come in. Fair value measurement, that's another one that, that typically is on our radar um, with a lot of share exchanges, uh, share exchange for property, share exchanges for assets those types of things, that's a, a topical area that, that we tend to focus on and, and have seen um, areas where we've come up with uh, some comments on. Financial statements. Um, <clears throat> really, I think in this area, I can almost say this is consistent. You know, a bit of a broken record on, on the MD&A and I don't know I don't know if it's just the nature of MD&A. We try not to change it unless we have to, and we maybe it's the last thing we do <laughs> in terms of the filings. But you know, liquidity and capital resources have have um, uh, still uh, been an issue for uh, for areas of deficiencies. Probably more less so now. You know, we're starting to come out of that bad cycle where um, where uh, financings are seem to be more readily apparent and and available, or for in fact, others are just changing businesses that are more uh, lucrative and profitable. Um, changes in accounting policy and initial adoption. I'm really focused probably on the initial adoption side here in trying to highlight that. Um, overall performance, again, generally, if we find problems, it's really more on the boilerplate level. So, you know, just trying to get some more, um, uh, some more detail that adds something. And I'd probably say that, you know, this is where my plug for the quarterly highlights really comes in is, is it gives you that ability to, to freeform things and, and not really think about plug in the numbers and then do the narrative around the numbers. It's really kind of tell the story in the way you want to tell it and don't worry about so much about the numbers and the fill in the blanks. <clears throat> Non-gap measures and forward-looking information. I think this is really a, a much harder hotter topic anyone who has revenue um, or uh, uh, in an industry that looks at cash flow um, it's certainly an area that we're continuing to watch and the forward-looking information side I would probably say it's it's not um, it's not the publishing of the forward-looking information it's the updating that we're really looking for a little more robustness in in terms of up updating Okay, take a bit of a pause here. So that was kind of our, our uh, looking back. Um, in terms of where we are today, I've kind of highlighted three, three kind of big areas, fintech, uh, marijuana, and um, reducing regulatory burden. And, and the last one's really because I have a, an interest in that. In terms of fintech, uh, we, we have blockchains, bitcoins, cryptocurrencies. And I, I was uh, asking our fintech, how, how do I learn about this? Like, what, what, what can I do? So I, I actually jokingly said, can I ask Siri? And then I actually put it to our fintech team. And they came back with the screenshots of what Siri says on each one of these. And they're actually pretty good. So, um, you know, that, that really is probably just more of a plug to get educated uh, uh, for, uh, for those of us who aren't really playing in that space. Uh, it's a pretty hot area. I think we see it every day and we see a, a real shift in, in momentum 
to move from, I guess, the old, um, the old, what I say is the, uh, uh, I guess, the historical mining sense. Now we're into electronic mining. And uh, so, you know, I, I guess we got to keep up with the kids and, uh, and think about that. But, uh, but you can go into Siri and actually it's probably a, a, a good little lesson on what blockchain, bitcoins and cryptocurrencies are. Um, our tech team has put out a staff notice on, uh, it's really f more focused on cryptocurrencies, um, but it's a good education uh, uh, one there. And, and I've noted the, um, the number, so it's probably worthwhile. Uh, I read through it as fairly educational because I look at it and, and I tend to hear more about it in the, in the, in the news. And, and we're starting to very much see a, a wave of, of FinTech come through, through our office. But, you know, a lot of it you're starting to hear all, all day, all the, all the time about blockchain, Bitcoins, and, and the cryptocurrencies kind of split. I don't, don't want to use the word bifurcate because I got that in my head. It's the you know in, in initial coin offerings and initial token offerings, and these things are, are quite different. Uh, the staff notice goes through a bit on that. If you're in an industry that is exploring uh, um, you know this technology or these avenues of, of technology, we have a tech team at, at the BCSC that's dedicated to this these types of um, industry um, specific uh, products and um, services. And so, you know, I put it up there, when in doubt, reach out. Uh, they're, they're happy to talk through it. I think there's a lot of debate out there because it is evolving. There's a lot of talk about, you know, we have an initial coin offering, an initial token offering. Are those securities? Are they simply, um, you know, some sort of reward system? And I think it really, it is really different and, and worth the discussion because, Subtle nuances, I think, will determine whether it's a security and then under the purveyance of the Securities Commission or simply something else that's that's more in tune to fundraising. So there's lots of things out there. Um, you know, Bitcoins <laughs> is where I say I know I'm getting old because when I when I look at Bitcoins, the, the, the younger people say, well, geez, it just keeps going up and going up. And I'm like, yeah, but what's created. There's nothing in society that this is creating other than a currency and a currency that is just untraceable. So, you know, I kind of maybe it's it's the old uh, I, I got to see it, touch it before I can believe that it's really a, a benefit to society. But, you know, where they say Bitcoins have gone up like, I don't know, 10 times this year, like it's it's phenomenal. So that's a bit of my uh, lead in to being a Luddite on this technology. But marijuana. A growing industry. So, <laughs> um, this is an area I'm actually fairly familiar with, only because of the research on the on the regulatory side. But uh, it's got a lot of press lately, um, and certainly there's there's a lot of talk out there. And and as we swing towards um, the legalization in Canada, and and really the legalization throughout the world, we're seeing a lot more marijuana um, companies or companies that are looking to um, I guess swerve into the to the marijuana space and and be part of the wave as we go through it. Um, so I put this up here. Is there a Trump effect? And really, what I was thinking about is is in the U.S. There's a very there's a very specific uh, dichotomy on the legal framework in the U.S. <clears throat> States like it, legalized it. Federal uh, uh, authorities. It continues to be a Schedule One um, a narcotic. So uh, at the federal level, it is illegal, and at the state level, it's legal. So what we have is really a butting of heads in that in that legal uh, framework. Um, the past administration was under President Obama was very open to the concept of letting the states decide and move towards more of a, a legalization framework, state by state allowing states and the population to decide by vote. And so far, 28 states have, have kind of swung that way, at least on the medical side, and a lot more have kind of started to join in on the recreational side. Um, what we will find is January 1st, 2018, California goes legal with the uh, recreational side. And I think that's a tipping point in the overall um, population in the US. 
So I think now they, they kind of say that once the groundswell hits California and if they legalize as they've intended and voted on that, uh, you know, this will this will bring it much more to a, a political debate. And right now, the the odds are being dealt with on a forbearance uh, under the old Obama Obama administration. There was something called the Cole Memorandum, which was put up by the then Attorney General uh, Cole who basically said if states put in um, a framework for legalization and, a, and that framework addresses eight key points that uh, the federal government will not use federal resources to, to step in. So it really will be hands off as long as you have a framework that's robust that addresses eight key areas. And the eight key areas are like um, keeping criminal activity out of it, uh, money laundering out of it, out of, a, out of the hands of children, um, and um, cross um, state um, movement of of like so growing in one area and selling in another. So right now we're we're at that uh, at that point. The real key though is their attorney general Jeff Sessions does not like legalization of marijuana. So he's made some grumblings, and uh, those grumblings have been to try to move the states to more of a, a federal view of illegality. Um, but he doesn't have the power within Congress to do so. So that was really my, my idea here of, of the Trump effect. What it's really caused in the Canadian aspect is what are we going to do about it from the regulator side. Right now, the, the exchange, uh, the venture exchange and TSX has put out guidance saying that they're looking at issuers who have um, some exposure to U.S. Uh, activities in the marijuana space, and they're going to look at that from a continued listing perspective. Um, simultaneously, we put out a staff notice really putting out our regulatory views and we're really looking at it from a disclosure basis. So that, that staff notice is out there, it gives our views on what we're expecting for disclosure side of things and what issuers who are, are basically connected to the U.S. marketplace on, on U.S. marijuana activities are expected to be doing in their disclosure. So that's a good area for you to, to kind of pick up on if, if you are thinking in going in that area or seeking clarity because you are in that industry. Um, the last area in terms of update is regulatory burden project. So after we did the venture ish were um, streamlining, we really kind of stepped back and said, well, maybe it's time to you know really look at this regulatory burden as an overall um, overall. Uh, bigger project and try to find key areas that we can look at in terms of reducing regulatory burden rather than try to just do it uh, uh, in terms of venture issuers versus non-venture issuers. So in April we put out a consultation paper. That consultation paper was open for comment until I think the end of July. Um, we got 57 comment letters back. Uh, which was great. Um, in terms of the current status, we're evaluating those comment letters, trying to uh, identify key themes. Um, for any that, that read the consultation paper and or commented, uh, some of the key themes that became apparent to us, modifying or get rid of the, getting rid of the business acquisition report. Um, so that's one that, that we're looking at. Um, there was also a, a lot of uh, feedback on uh, reducing duplication uh, in financial statements, MDNA, and any IFRS requirements that are then duplicated in MDNA. So just trying to streamline that. So th that's likely to play out uh, as we go through the process. Um, the other ones, a um, couple of key areas were there was uh, moderate uh, support for looking at um, developing an alternative pr prospectus model. And I'll actually call it an, an offering model because it's like, could we think about getting rid of the prospectus altogether and coming up with some other um, avenue for offerings? So that's that that looks to have um, uh, sufficient support, but uh, time will tell as we go through the the kind of the review of the consultation paper. And the last probably one area that seemed to stick out in the in the uh, comments received was enhancing electronic delivery. So I think that one seemed to have a fair bit of support from the from the marketplace, and a lot of that has to do with really just recognizing the the shift in technology from when the rules came in to, to what it's like now. Um, that still could have some challenges, but um, 
but certainly enhancing electronic delivery was was on the uh, the radar for that. In terms of what what's next, as I said, we're still kind of assessing the comment letters, trying to put our thoughts together, um, narrow down the key themes. Um, but I think you could probably look for something in early spring to uh, to uh, indicate where we think we're going to go with this and key areas that we think we've identified and would like to move forward on. In terms of what's on the horizon, in terms of policy projects, um, we, we have an upcoming issue-oriented review, um, very narrow on real estate, really looking at uh, the disclosure of FFO and AFFO in, in line with um, uh, a, a real PACs um, proposed uh, disclosure standards. So, if you're in that real estate industry, that, that might hit you. If not, it, it's pretty narrow. <clears throat> policy projects, other policy projects. Climate change, I think I had mentioned this at last year's session, and we're still continuing to work on that and, and trying to gather information, uh, assess current disclosure, and see if we can come up with areas on, on climate change disclosure that, that makes sense for the marketplace. Lastly, on the policy projects, non-GAAP financial measures. This is an area that just seems to keep churning and churning and churning. Um, I would think it's a staff notice, I kind of say it's the staff notice that never dies. I think it's gone through three or four iterations now, but I think what we're trying to do is step back, maybe think about non-GAAP uh, financial measures and see if we can't put it into a rule and try to just clarify it so that there's a little more um, clarity in terms of expectations for the marketplace in that area. Um, and we'll continue to uh, work on the Reducing Regulatory Burden Project. And in terms of the National Systems Renewal Project, we're still working on that, and that's, that will likely see the replacement of CEDAR, SEDI, and the uh, National Registration Database. So uh, hopefully that will um, take place sometime in the future, I, although I don't expect it in the next fiscal year. I think it's still about 18 months off. Um, CMRA still seems to churn along in the background. Um, fairest way I can say this is this is a political decision in terms of direction that we're getting and timing. Um, the timing that's currently on the table is again December 1st, 2018, but um, if you were to ask me on a probability basis, I would think that that would shift, but that's, that's in government's hands, not really uh, driven by us as regulators. So we're very much reactive on that, Aaron. And I think that's it. So um, there's some contacts and uh, context and I'll pass it on to uh, Arez for the last piece.